Drust. Um, I worked in the video game for a really long time, over uh, 10 years, and now I am a member of Pixelogic. I am their artist slash creative uh, development uh, director. So I've got a piece here I'm going to show you guys how I made it. So this is kind of out of the typical style you might have seen from me. So I do a lot of military stuff. That was what my career in the game industry involved highly, was creating realistic military creatures and characters. So this is a little bit of a uh, different kind of uh, outlet to create something for CTN. So I made up this little project with this little girl here. And she's kind of like a swimmer, cartoony girl. And I was trying to get you know, something that was new and something that I don't see a lot of stuff done in ZBrush for. And I started thinking about stop motion and how you, know, you could use ZBrush to generate stop motion assets or uh, different pieces. And you know, quickly do your face sculpts, quickly block out your shapes and your forms, and then just 3D print them out. Right? And then you have your assets already built for your stop motion armatures, and you can animate, switch your parts out, and get everything done. Um, so here we have the girl there, and tomorrow this should be a little bit more assembled, but I have the 3D version of her all printed out. And so you can see she has all sorts of pieces, and she's massive. Uh, right now she has this nice kind of hole in her head, because the idea for her was she was going to be a bobblehead, and then have the stop motion parts uh, printed out on it. So she actually has all interchangeable face parts, basically, for the model. I still have to go and put magnets in. That's tonight's task. So if you come by tomorrow, um, we'll see a little more uh, fleshed out. But basically, the premise for her, for stop motion, is that you have a face plate. So your back plate of your model. And then here you have sockets for eyes. And these eyes, you know, you'd move around with pins, basically, to pose them where they look. And then you have different expression plates. And so these are the expression plates in which this, you know, whatever the poses the character wants, or you want them to like do, say like, you know, different vowels for speech, um, expressions, things like that, you just swap these plates in and out. So you're not ending up, you know, having to retweak mouths and stuff as you're actually doing it, you're just pulling the plates off, on and off. And so this system allows you to, you know, get all that variation. So I have multiple versions of her face. I even have a blank, because this is like the traditional way to do it, where you'd actually sculpt a blank first. And then you'd actually go through and mass produce this blank, and then cover different sculpt areas and parts to get those lips in different forms. And then you'd have all your variations for your phone M's and things like that. So a very uh, interesting way to kind of get your stop motion stuff kind of looking correct and working. Well, ZBrush handles this stuff really well. So all these cuts and forms and shapes were all done inside ZBrush using the DynaMesh feature. So everything in here was 100% created inside of ZBrush. I didn't go to another program for it. Um, I even exported it out of ZBrush for 3D printing. So inside of ZBrush is an option where you just set the height of your model. So this model was set for 10-inch uh, height. So it's measured from the base plane to the top of her head. And then it's literally just set out as an STL, which went straight to the printer and got printed just like this. So I didn't do any other uh, work in another program or anything like that to get the model in ZBrush to a print form to be ready to uh, be used in stop motion. So I'm going to go through some of the processes I used to create this, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I'm going to quickly also scroll through some of the other stuff in case you're not, I'll just quickly go through some of the other stuff I do. So I do, I've been trying on a tangent for like random stuff that I haven't seen before. So this is a chair I did for SIGGRAPH this year. And if you think about it, no one's really doing uh, 3D printed dollhouse furniture. There's probably a market there somewhere, mass produced dollhouse furniture. If you have daughters. Make your own dollhouse furniture in ZBrush, print it out. Um, some of the stuff I've done for Z Classroom, so radios, a lot of military stuff, ghillie suits, once again, all ZBrush created. So there's actually tutorials online on ZBrush's uh, ZBrush Central site, which breaks down the entire process I did for uh, both these models. So even down to the fibers that we used for the ghillie suit. Uh, other stuff, I like trying to mimic shapes and realism. So this was just one uh, I did for a task to see how close I could actually get to a climbing cam, like 100%. So just all the way through that. And then in my free time, I uh, teach at ZBrush workshops every once in a while, too. So this was for a class I taught for them. I still need to finish this model, so someday. This model has arms and legs and a weapon and all sorts of stuff, but uh, I need to finish it. It's not on my list. And then I also do like you know random cartoon stuff every once in a while. So this was a plane um, I did a while ago, an egg plane. And then I also have done some stuff for McFarland. 
So if you guys are Walking Dead fans, um, these just got released like last month. So if you pick up any of the Riot Zombie toys, um, I worked with uh, McFarland to uh, generate these guys, and they did an excellent job on the finalizing it and getting it out. So really great some stuff. And then some quick sculpts uh, using reference from people. This Flemeth, the uh, it's a fan fiction or a fan made version of Flemeth, and that's actually my mother. She doesn't know she's Flemeth. I don't even know if she knows what, who Flemeth is, so uh, she won't care. But there we go. All right, in a ZBrush. All right, so here I have the uh, final model. This is the rendered version of the model. So this is before I cut up any of the uh, pieces to actually get it to print form. So if I do it, it'll explode here. You can kind of see that I build a lot of stuff in parts. So kind of like how Jared was showing with all his uh, you know, insert meshes, I do a similar thing. I break up stuff in a lot of parts. And I do this primarily because I like having individual assets to work from, and I can isolate these parts individually rather than having big files or big scenes. So this character right here is 38 subtools right now, right? You may think that's a lot and it's kind of unorganized, but I actually go through and name all these and get them like in an organized fashion. So it's really easy to manage even with 38 uh, subtools here. And all these pieces, you know, they usually start out as, you know, on the main forms and then just get broken off. And when they're separated like this, I have the ability to isolate them as I mentioned, and then I can also tessellate them a lot more than if it was all together. So she's pretty light, she's only 15 million, so I didn't go too overboard, but on some of the military characters I do, we're looking at 150 million for one model, uh, things like that. And that's partially because I just throw a lot of noise on stuff too to cover up uh, some of my sculpting flaws. So that's a little thing there. So for this girl, the main time constraint on her was actually the design process. It's not the actual execution. Um, I spent a lot of time back and forth in the design. So fish head kind of happened, and then I kept going from there. And then she had a dress on at one point, and then the dress didn't work. And I make a lot of pieces and throw them away, which I think is part of just working in the game industry as well. So uh, don't be afraid of uh, you know, making something and not using it. It happens a lot. And uh, you just grow to get used to it and just keep powering forward. So for her body is one of the uh, initial things I started off with. And this was created just with Z-Spheres. So this is basically my start for her mesh. Now, you know, a lot of people will see they start from a sphere, so I definitely do use spheres. So this is her start of her head, which is basically just a Z-sphere, or just a uh, polysphere that I've imported through uh, Lightbox here. So just go into Lightbox by hitting comma, go into Tool, and then there's this polysphere option here. And so I'll just bring that in, and that's what this sphere is. And I just use Move a little bit to kind of establish the form of that fish mouth being open. Now, the other thing I use a lot are Z-spheres, right? I really like Z-Spheres still. They're kind of an older uh, methodology of uh, kind of generating shapes inside a ZBrush. But I like the ability to, I use them as like armatures basically, or shape armatures, to find silhouettes and forms without doing any uh, sculpting on them. So right now I'm in a Z-Sketch mode. So I can move all this stuff around and change proportions, change heights, anything. And I still get that kind of silhouette. So if I want to kind of like sink down a little bit more, you know, I kind of do that. If I wanted to kind of, you know, bend back or lean forward, like I have all that freedom right now to kind of play with this, and I'm not really distorting any of my mesh. Like I haven't sculpted anything. I'm just looking at the shapes and forms. Now a lot of people when they do the DynaMesh stuff, you know, you can do this with Transpose, but I don't find it as fast as just getting in there and doing it with the actual sketch. So you can find like all the weight areas that you don't really want to, you know, you want to get figured out before you actually start sculpting. Now this isn't like a final, you know, thing because along the way I'm actually working on her. She's going to change more anyway because. My theory on art is it's always changing, it's always growing, so even with conceptual art, when I get a piece of concept art, it's a concept, it's a guide, but it's not the final. Um, oftentimes it's only in one aspect, you know, you get a front view concept or a side view, but you, you, you kind of have the liberty or the freedom, that's your artistic ability to kind of establish that concept in 3D. And so you're hired as a, you know, when you get hired as a model or a character artist, you know, you get concept, and you know, it's nice to follow it 100%, but they hired you for a reason. They don't just want you to just mass produce you know, the same thing that the concept art is true. They want your input, your take on the concept art, and how to make it you know, explode even more, or keep evolving, and become like a stronger piece of art along the line. So it's that collaborative uh, process. All right, so with these Z sketches, you know, I just start out like this. And then it's really easy to get this to a mesh you can sculpt with. You just come down here to this adaptive skin slider, and you just turn preview on, and it's going to give you a mesh version of your model. Right? So here's what it's going to look like as a mesh. And you can change the density here. 
At this point, I don't really care too much. Like you have, you know, uneven distributions of polygons through here. But I'm just looking for the form, the silhouette. I'm not really looking for anything else. So I just keep it at two, and then I'm just going to hit Make Adaptive Skin. And when you do that, it's going to clone this Z-Sketch uh, version off to its own tool. It's going to live up here. And this is now a polygonal object, or a mesh you can actually sculpt on. So now you just come to your original file here, and I'm just going to append this into the scene here. So now I have the appended version of that Z-Sphere as its own subtool. So I can still come back to this original Z-Sphere and edit this. So if I find out you know, along the ways, like in the early sculpting process, that I really want her to be taller, I can go back to this Z-Sphere, make her taller, do the skin again. I didn't lose a lot of time uh, on my sculpting. So after it gets to this Z-Sphere thing here, I'll start kind of you know, blocking in some forms and some shapes for the anatomy. Now this is just rough usually on the thing. I'm still trying to get you know, silhouettes and shapes on the model. So right now I just have the clay build-up brush selected. If you need a ZBrush, it's really easy to select all these brushes in here. So you know, you'll see people with custom interfaces, not to knock on custom interfaces, but there's a whole series of hotkeys that just automatically create when you use ZBrush. So if you hit B, it's going to open this brush menu. And then in here, you'll see there's these, all these little letters up the top here. These are things you can isolate by. So if I hit B and then hit the letter C, it's going to give me all the brushes that start with C. So if I'm that I want this clay tubes brush, my hotkey would be B, C, T, right? So if I need to quickly select the curve tube brush, it's just B, C, T. Three hotkeys, three button presses. These get ingrained every time like I just open ZBrush. You look at it once, you know what it is. And now I'm going to remember that clay tubes is B, C, T. If I want to go back to standard brush, B, S, T. I don't really need icons to click around, do anything else, because the hotkeys are so fast on the keyboard, you know, I can get to those brushes as I need them pretty quick. So very fast kind of solution for your workflow. And brush-wise, I only use like a few a time, few. I don't use a, a lot of brushes, like maybe five or six. And a lot of guys you'll talk to actually do the same thing. They don't use a lot of brushes while they're sculpting. They're very, uh, you know, think about traditional sculptors. It's, uh, you know, you'll see people that do it traditionally. And ZBrush is basically a digital means to the traditional medium. So if you've ever done any clay sculpting, ZBrush is a good way to go because it's really close to actual traditional methods. So when you talk about brushes, you look at guys and, you know, that have been doing clay sculpture for years, and they may only use, you know, they have all these tools, but they use probably three. And then they use a pencil that's like broken in half and has like half the uh, graphite like turned into side or something. And that's their primary tool they use. So really interesting uh, kind of workflows. And you think they have all this stuff in here, you don't have to use all of it. You know? It's nice, but you don't need all of it. So I'll get, you know, basic forms blocked out, and then I'll divide this a little bit more. So this, you know, divide up one or so. And then just continuing sculpting. Now, when I actually start getting in here, you know, I'll start getting, you know, weird stuff like this, right? I don't want this to happen. You know, say if I want her stomach to stick out really far. But right now, it's distorting. So this is where I switch to Dynamesh. So I go from, you know, the Z sketch to get my basic shape, do a little modeling on there, and then I'll go in Dynamesh this now. And when you run Dynamesh in here, it's going to evenly topologize your model with this, you know, basically it's the digital clay function inside of ZBrush. So you can see here, it's actually generated geometry, and it's even across the entire surface. So if I go undo, this was my original topology, so you see I'm getting uneven topology. And if I Dynamesh 2, 512 is a little bit too much there. It's now even that out. So you can see now when I sculpt here, it's giving me more of a nicer form, and if I did a straight line say from here to there, it's not going to give me that stair stepping. It's a very clean form. So I'll work to an extent and then use actual Dynamesh. And so I do go to Dynamesh. It's not just scan Z-Sketch. And I'll just go back and forth on that. If you Dynamesh at a lower resolution, uh, Paul's a big fan of this, um, you can then now subdivide up. And then you still have these lower subdivisions. So it's not like you Dynamesh to your highest form. Um, you can Dynamesh at a lower resolution and then just subdivide. That low resolution is going to give you that even topology spread, and now you can just come in and sculpt on your model. So that's the basic, you know, kind of stuff I do for the body stuff. It's nothing, you know, really uh, incredible. It's basically really simple, just sculpting and just form building. Um, one thing you see a lot of people do, and it, it takes a little while to get this, is I like to do smooths. I smooth a lot. Um, I use some hard smooths and things like that too. There's multiple algorithms inside of ZBrush for smoothing as well. So your normal smooth, you just hold shift, and it just smooths it out. Sometimes this isn't fast enough for me. I want it faster. So there's actually, if you come to the brush modifier here, and you go to the smooth brush modifiers, there's these uh, different smooth modes, right? 
Now there's also these brushes are stored in light box, you can get them at any time. But if you change the slider here, you'll see that zero is standard, one is stronger, two is balanced, three subdivision, vision, stroke, yada, yada, yada. So if I want this stronger, I'm just gonna set this weighted value to one. And now it actually smooth this out now, it's gonna give me a stronger smooth. So if you ever find smoothing's not strong enough, I know a lot of people tune, turn down their smooth settings, I usually turn them up um, to get kind of stuff, you know, hammered out really quick. Cause I'm just really looking for that form and that shape and that silhouette, just get that breakup. Another thing with smooth is there's a alt smooth. So normal smooth is just shift, but if you hold down shift and then release shift, it does a polish. So polish smooth. So if you ever find any areas on your model that have spikes or pinches, like this might be a, a good candidate. No. Dynamish took out all my, uh, my pinching, but if you ever come across pinching, you can start smoothing and then release shift and it'll give you this polish smooth and it does a polish smooth feature across the surface on just smooth everything back out. So it'll take any of those triangles you have, say if you have a mesh that's like, you know, scan data, it's really rough, use that polish smooth and it's gonna even them all out really nice. It's not gonna give you those poles that kinda happen in 3D meshes. For the, uh, you know, the head stuff here, it's basically the same thing, so I'll have this. I actually keep the body on. And I'll just divide it up some and then just using, you know, clay tubes and clay buildup just start blocking out my forms. And I usually generate, you know, my block outs really rough. So I'm just, you know, once again, just looking for these silhouettes and these forms. And so I'm just, you know, going through and trying to find shapes and forms that find like, you know, a little bit appealing for me. So we're looking a little bit rough here. And all sculpts have an ugly period. I mean, same with, you know, any sort of conceptual design and stuff like that. Like, you just gotta kinda like hammer through. So she's got fins on her too, right? So I had fins on her head. So you can see she's got you know, these crazy fins that are sticking out. So these are created really easy too, using the same kind of dynamesh process. So I kind of establish you know, where I want these fins to be, right? And then I just come in, I just mask this out. Just mask out an area. And then to invert the mask, just hold control and click off, and I'll do an invert. And then I just take the move brush, and I just start pulling these forms out, right? That's a little bit too far, just smooth that back down. So you just kind of pull these out to get your form. Now as you notice, this is distorting your geo you know, pretty bad, right? You're getting all these triangles. So this is pretty much a mess. But since this is a dynameshed object, or it's gonna be a dynameshed object, it's gonna even that topology back out. So dynamesh is a great way to kind of get your you know, shapes pulled out really quick on your mesh, and then just sculpt them back in. So all the fins and stuff like that were all created the same way. Um, back face mask is another one. As you see I got some collapse through here. So if you go to your brush modifier, there's an auto masking. And there's an option called back face mask. Back face mask. And so now when you sculpt in that area, it's not going to collapse through. Also, if you get a lot of pinching in ZBrush, so if I smooth this down a whole lot, right? And now say I want to pull this out, or I want to sculpt on it, it may be too small. Well, this is where an inflate brush works wonders. So if you just go B, I, N, which will give you inflate, you can now inflate that back out. So if you have to have any trouble sculpting like fingers and things like that, um, oftentimes I'll just come through and inflate them to get them back to that volume I want them at, and then go and sculpt it on them again. So pretty easy uh, stuff there. It's just basic sculpting, basic sculpting. All right, so we're gonna move on, because I could sit there and do that all day, but it's probably gonna bore you guys. And I'll see if I can find number two here. So here we have her uh, body kind of sculpted out. And this was done the same way with this sketch. For the hands and stuff, I basically did that same process where I just did with the fins. So I'd take the move brush, pull them out where I want them to go, and then redynamesh, pull out some more, redynamesh, and then go in and sculpt on them. So these were just started from those original nubs that I had in the actual sketch. So these things right here. So there wasn't any real data on them. And then actually getting them into this way, I just used, you know, inflate to bring them out, redynamesh to get that shape nice and square, and all the geometry really clean, and then just started pulling them out. Um, snake hooks, another awesome brush for this. You'll see a lot of people do stuff like this too. They actually take stuff and just pull them out in the snake hooks. And snake hooks destroys that geo, right? But as soon as you redynamesh that, it goes all nice and smooth again, and you can actually start building up with inflates and get your shapes and forms. So for the clothing and stuff, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. So I want to get to the actual subtraction stuff for the. Uh, 
stop motion aspects. But this is mostly done with masking. So I'll come in and start masking areas out. And you'll see a lot of people do this. There's uh, a lot of uh, tutorials on uh, this whole kind of stuff on ZBrush Central. And so you have like your mask generated. And what I do with masking too at this stage, I'll actually polygroup it. So if you hit Control W, if you have anything masked, it's going to give you a new polygroup. And so now you can kind of just select by that part if you want. Now the Control W masking also works with just visible stuff. So if I know I just want this chest and I want this to be a whole new polygroup, just hit Control W and now it's its own polygroup. And polygroups, think of them as like sub-elements um, inside other programs. So they're just, you know, pieces you can isolate from on your model. So I've got this one broken out by kind of UV setup. So I can actually isolate the arms if I need to sculpt underneath it. But then if I need the whole body back, it's there. So for clothing, let's go back to this little mask here. Usually just give that a polygroup. And you get this nice kind of shape here. And then I'll duplicate this tool. Because I use a lot of proxy meshes on my work, and I don't, you know, I oftentimes instead of saving, I just duplicate stuff. And so if I ever need to go back to that main body, it's there. Um, but now I have a new sub tool uh, that I can just mess with, and then if I mess up or do something crazy, um, I can go back up. So this one has that new polygroup here. Now a lot of people use the extract feature here, which you'll click on, and then it'll just kind of inflate it, and you can see how thick it is, and then it accepts. I use uh, panel loops a lot, and so this is a feature that was introduced in 4R5. I think Paul can uh, interject here. And in here, it's in the geometry tab, there's this edge loop thing. And in here is this option called panel loops. And what panel loops is going to do, it has the ability to give you a new panel for every polygroup you have on your model. So if I come back to your normal model here, you can see I have all these polygroups broken up, and I hit this panel loops here. It's going to give me a new panel loop across all there. So if you're doing like robot synthetic mech stuff, like uh, mannequin type things or things like that, this is a really cool way to do things. So you can just, you know, make polygroups on your model, run this panel loops, and you can get these really cool little like shapes all over the place. So if you want little like lines or seam lines on your model, a really neat way to do it. Now the other option with panel loops that I use more than this is actually I'll hide one aspect of it. So if I just want this shirt, I don't want the rest of the body inflated in panel loops, I just want this shirt. So if you just have the shirt selected and you run panel loops, it's only going to inflate that part, right? So I only got that shirt part. So I'll come just select the shirt I want. I'm going to change the thickness to something that's a little more manageable, a little thicker. And then just run panel loops, right? So there you see I have that start of that shirt geometry, the start of that mesh. So I just clear my mask, and then I'll just hide all these other parts. Now if you have this set up in one poly group, it's a lot quicker. This one's broken down, so I'm just going to do it like that. And then I'm just going to come here to modify topology and just delete hidden. So it just leaves me that shirt. Now I should have done the shirt all the way to the back. <laughs> I did not for no other reason than I just forgot about it. So now I turn my main body on and I have a nice new sub tool that is set up with this uh, panel loop system. Now one thing nice with panel loops too is it gives you polygroups around all these edges. So if you're doing mech armor and stuff, you can take uh, your move brush and if you come under the brush menu here, you can do this mask by polygroups and you can actually start conforming this stuff out. And since it's polygroups, you can get some really cool shapes out of this. So you can polish it down, just move stuff around, and you can get really cool armor um, generated this way. And since it's broken by panel groups, you can get like these really sharp kind of edges, you know, generated pretty quick. So another kind of cool functionality of the panel loop stuff. So going back to the shirt, you get this. So the other thing with the panel loops is that right now I've got these like kind of jaggies along these edges here. It's not really smooth. I'd come through and manually smooth all this out if I wanted to, to get it clean. But in the deformation tab, there's an option called uh, Polish by Groups. And so you can just run this, and it'll start smoothing these groups out. Now, once you do this once, you can sit here and keep doing this over and over again if you really wanted to. It takes a while. But then there's this option called Repeat to Active or Repeat to Other. So if you just want this to keep happening, you just can keep pressing it, and it'll keep polishing and keep smoothing. The same thing works for any of these other options in here. So if I wanted to ever, you know, make this a little bit bigger, right, or move it up, you know, to the side for some, and I wanted to keep doing it, you just keep repeating and repeat, and it's just going to keep cloning it and keep repeating that process. So you don't have to keep using these sliders if you're using these all the time. You can just do it once, and then just hit repeat, and then I'll keep doing it. So that's a little time saver um, we'll come across. So I'm just going to, you know, get this shirt a little bit smooth here. So something like that. Now, if you went to the UGM last night, I'll probably, I probably already showed this there, so this is uh, won't be anything new. But um, 
wrinkles and stuff. Um, you know, you can spend a lot of time doing wrinkles and things like that. For things like this with shirts, basically my new thing I've been doing is just getting in hard wrinkle edges. So not really doing anything clean up, just going in for the hard shapes, right? So just coming in and brushing these out hard. And not worrying about cleanup. And then after getting them something like this, now I'm coming over here to Z Remesher, which was released in 4R6. I'm running this. And this is going to Z Remesh this mesh. And it does a really nice option of a smooth kind of polished feature on these wrinkles. So if you're spending a lot of time doing wrinkles, try this method. Take your model, sculpt really large wrinkles on your model to get them like, you know, exactly kind of where you want them in shape and form. And then Z Remesh it and then just run like two subdivisions on it and you start getting your wrinkles kind of fleshed out a lot faster. So if you find yourself spending a lot of time you know, generating wrinkles, you're not getting the wrinkles you really want, try this method. It works pretty well. And so you see now you start to get, you know, these wrinkles are a little bit too big for her, but general uh, idea behind the wrinkle stuff. All right. Let's go back here to what we got going on. So all this clothing was made that same way, you know, just masking out areas and then doing the panel loops. So trim, the actual suit, the frill was used the same way, so I actually masked it out. And then as you saw I did with the panel loops, just pulling those objects out to the side, same thing, just pulled them out. And then I dynameshed them so it even that topology and then just sculpted them in. So this is not a, uh, anything but just, you know, traditional sculpting. So it's pulling the object out, getting the topology dense enough to kind of work with, and then just sculpting highs and lows. Very simple uh, solutions. And so this is the head after uh, it got fleshed out. You can see I still got some cleanup on the back here for the ears. But that same process of masking, pulling it out, and I just went in and sculpted it on its own. All the areas through here. And she got some teeth. And these were just uh, boxes I inserted. I'm going to go through here a little bit quick. So she ended up looking like this. Head was the same way as the body. So same way as the head. So just the Dynamesh sculpt and just added features to it. Nothing too uh, exciting there. These eyes and stuff, they're actually just inserted polyspheres. So, you know, it's not, you have primitives inside of ZBrush you can use as well. So you have those polyspheres, you just take your bottle, input that in. Print that up real quick. You can see this came in really small. If you're here for Jared's thing, he talks about the unify button over here. What this does is it's going to take this sphere and unify it to the scene size. So it's going to hit unify. And so it's kind of taken the average of the entire scene and unified it, so now you have it a little bit larger. And then you just take that and move it in place, if I have it selected correctly. Let's try this again. There we go. Now, a lot of times, you know, you'll hear people, you can do scale. So you have a transfer line to scale, which will do this. I often just use this side slider over here under deformation, so I'll just size this down to get the scale I want. Another thing with moving stuff in ZBrush, you have the transpose lines, so you can just move them like normal by just clapping this inner circle. But you also have a screen space move. So if you have move selected, you can hold down Alt and move, and you'll move in screen space. So if you ever used any other kind of 3D applications, this is a really quick way to move stuff in place. So if I want to get these eyes you know, on her fish skull here, let me turn off her existing ones. Just hold Alt and just quickly move them into place. So if you ever find the uh, transpose lines to be a little bit uh, Difficult to move. Just you know, make sure you have move selected, hold alt, and you can move in screen space. It saves a lot of time. Now, if you have one eye in one position, you know, I could duplicate this and clone it over the other side. But there's an option here in geometry under modify under modified topology. It's called mirror and weld, and it's going to take everything on one side of the model over here and throw it on the other side. So with one click, after I do my subdivisions here, I've now got both eyes in there. So a really easy way to uh, create like eyeballs and stuff. This works for anything on any geo. So if you want, you know, you, you can model, basically if you want to model one side of an object, you can then just mirror it over the other side and it's going to give you nice uh, results. So you don't always have to model in symmetry if you don't want to. All right, so that's the base for the body. Now I'm going to talk about how I made her little uh, flippers here. So these flippers that are on a body here. Now, one thing with ZBrush is you'll find, you know, a lot of people bring this up too, that you can use all these little features and tools to get your base mesh and then you do sculpting. And so another great option that uh, I use a lot is this thing called Shadowbox. So I'm just going to come here and just append a polysphere 
3D object, that nice triangle shape, into my scene here. This comes in a new subtool. It's a little bit crazy and big up here. I'm just going to move it down, holding that Alt button, and just move it into place somewhere around here. Just to get it kind of centered around my model here. And now I'm going to come to the Geometry tab, and I'm going to go to Shadow Box. I'm going to leave my resolution, say, something around 256, and then set Polish to 5, and then I'm going to hit Shadow Box. And what Shadow Box is, let me hide this stuff here so you guys can see this, is it gives you this nice box. And this box allows you to create geometry by simple masking. So if I come to draw, and I hold down control for a mask pen, and I just mask, I just draw whatever I want. It's going to give me a shape. Very quick way to generate shapes and form. So you saw all that stuff, you know, that uh, Jared was working on a mech. So if you want to do you know, mech structure stuff, and this is one way to do it. Jewelry design uses this all the time for generating the floral patterns, things like that. It's just simple masking. Just mask a shape, and bam, you got an object. If you want this thicker, just come over to the side here and add a thickness. So right now that's pretty thin. So if I mask a size like this, it's now thicker. It's a very easy way to generate shapes. And you can generate really complex shapes with this too. Now one thing that's awesome with this is that it works with alphas. So I use a lot of alphas on a lot of stuff I do. And I'll make custom alphas, same way I make custom parts. Sometimes I don't use them all. Um, in this case I have you know, some here. So for her flipper, I knew the shape I wanted it, right? It's going to have this unique kind of shape. So I just made a quick alpha. Now I could sculpt it on the plane here as well. But if you know you have a picture of Flipper as a reference, you just you know take that and then mask it out and generate your alpha. You never know when you're going to need to use it again, so that's why I just kind of save it out as its own uh, PSD file. So I'm just going to load that in here. So I got my Flipper loaded, and now I make sure it's selected on my mask brush. And I'm going to change my stroke to rectangle, and then change it to square. And what this is going to do, and now I can draw this out, and it's going to be this perfect square rectangle. So now I can position that somewhere on that plane and done, and there's that flipper shape, right? Instantly. So if it's a little bit thick, and come to this side here, and I'm going to get out of square again. Let me, let me change that back to drag rec. i turn this off. So I'm coming and I make it, you know, a little bit more of a sliver type thing. And so now it's a little bit thinner. So you can curl that shape real easy inside a ZBrush. After you're done with that, you just come over here and go to the Geometry tab and just unclick Shadow Box. And now this mesh is part of your scene. So if you see here now, we've got the girl here, and she's got her flipper part, right? She's got her flipper part ready to go. So I'm just going to rotate this quick. Let's just select it and draw a transpose line out. Then you can rotate. I got a polygroup masking on. In ZBrush, if you hold shift and drain your transpose line out, it gives you a straight line. So it's going to do it up down. So if you need to rotate, you know, you want a perfectly straight on the canvas axis. Um, just start dragging this thing out, and when you hold shift, it's going to lock. So it'll lock into 45s, and it'll lock into verticals. So it's going to give you a locked transpose line. And once you have it locked, you can now get that perfect rotation. So you can now rotate it down. Now when you're rotating, you can hold shift, and it'll snap to those angles as well. So I know I want it perfectly flat to be on the base of her foot, so I'm just going to rotate it to that angle there. And now I'm going to go back to move. So now she's on a surfboard. Move back down to her feet here. Just move that over. So a little bit big. She's got clown. She went to clown college. Got some clown feet. And I'm just going to scale that down. Now once again, I can use deformation or just this option here. And then I'm going to use alt this time to kind of position it where her foot would be. And then alt back like that. Just something like that. Just getting it close to her foot bed. I'm going to put a little rotation on this to kind of follow that heel. Now, for when I want to rotate this, I want to be able to kind of see where her foot is. Because her foot is set out, you know, a little bit off. You know, it's not straight perpendicular. So if you come to tra or, uh, transparency over here, you'll be able to see that mesh underneath. And now you can rotate it just a little bit. And you can still see that foot. It's a little bit hard on this monitor. Um, but you can see that foot bed there. And I can just rotate it, you know, line it up a little bit better and turn transparency off. So you have that foot plane, you know, kind of lined up where you want it. Now, the other options on here, we've got... You know, for this, this is a pretty complex shape. We've got these little lines that come out. We've got a foot thing that actually goes on her foot. And then we've got this strap that goes along the back. So this is all you know, easily to make in ZBrush 2. So for the footbed pads, I'm actually going to do it straight on and then rotate it. I'm going to come through and just you know, do some masking quick. So I'm going to grab the 
mask lasso brush here. Oops. And where you at, mask lasso? There we go. And I'm just gonna mask out and that side. And mask out this side. And mask out that center. Look how wonky that is. That is not good. We don't want that. All right. So you get another trick. Another trick. Mask pen. <coughs> All right. So, in ZBrush, if you're drawing, you know, it's easier to draw, you know, left and right on your Wacom tab. Like, it's sometimes hard to get straight lines going this way, things like that. But if you're working with shapes, say like a shape like this, it's sometimes difficult to get this straight line. Like, if I want this to be an absolute straight line, you know, I want it to be on my canvas like this. I don't want it to be like this. Well, if you go to your transpose lines again, you'll notice there's these little white dots, right? And so with these, you can actually take your model, and when you click these little white dots, it's going to angle it based on that line you drew. So let's show you that again. So if I want to draw a straight line like this, right? I want my model to take it, I want to rotate it to the side so I can draw straight, right? Well, I don't want it to actually rotate the model, I just want it to rotate in the scene. So if you draw a transpose line out and then click on this white circle here, it's going to rotate it based on that transpose line. So this transpose line is now straight across. Now they just did a camera position shift. So it didn't do anything to your model. The model's still where it is, didn't rotate anything. It just shifted the camera. So it shifted your model in canvas space. And now you can now draw that straight line across it, right? So if you start drawing and hold shift, you can start drawing that straight line out. So if you ever have any areas on your model that are really hard to get straight lines on, Rotate it with that transpose line and the white dot, and then you can do your masking in that perpendicular or horizontal format. So I can mask, you know, let's go back to this position here. And I want that, you know, that edge line there to be straight. So from here to here, straight all the way down. Click that white line and get it to rotate like this. Now I can go back to my mask rectangle and draw that rectangle out, right? Now it's a straight line. So you can do that really quick to get uh, straight lines inside ZBrush. Now you can rotate your model back. You've got a straight line of that mask since you use that rectangular mask on your model now. So a little cool uh, trick there. So for the basic flipple parts, you know, I'd go through and do that for the front and the side and then the other side as well. And then I'd just come in and I'd just clear out this mask on the back part because I only want that top lip, right? I only want it to come out on the top of the mesh. I don't want to stick it out of the back. I don't want to distort the edges. I just want it out of that top. So I'm going to take that now, and then I'm just going to use transpose line again. I'm just going to click on the actual item here, and then just move it. So something like that, right? So now I can come through and do that re-dynamesh process again. And we're going to turn and blur and project off. And now you can start cleaning that up. Now one brush that's really awesome for kind of hard surface cleanup stuff is the H polish brush, so BH. We'll give you H polish. And this one does a really awesome job where you can just hit an edge and it does like a really nice hard polish. So you can see you start getting this kind of really nice kind of hard shape here. And so you can generate this, you know, pretty quick. I'm kind of a, I find H polish to be really relaxing, so I'll spend a lot of time doing this. But it's by choice. Um, it's not really a necessity. Um, but I just like doing it. And so you can come through and you actually clean up all your edges pretty well. Zebrush has some other options too for cleaning up this stuff. So if you don't want to be a glutton for punishment, and clean it up the hard way. I'm going to do this a few times. There's this option that's uh, pretty good that's called uh, clay polish as well, which lives over here in the tab. And you can run this, and it'll actually go through and try to find those edges, lock them in, and then polish everything else flat. So you can start getting those hard shapes um, out of your model. So that's the basic generation for the flipper stuff. Um, I'm running gun, and Paul's going to kick me out here um, soon, so I'm just going to keep going forward with some of the stuff. Because I want to show you guys the foot bed and the uh, actual elastic stuff, and then we got to get into the cutting. So, so for the foot pad, it was just a uh, simple appended uh, sphere again, so I just appended a polysphere in. And it'll come in, you know, probably a little bit big or a little small. So there's the actual ball there. And just ignore the fact that I uh, sculpted that upside down. I can rotate it. I'm going to up the sphere a little bit and move it in place. Boom, boom, boom. So something like that. 
to move it back over here. And then I'm going to delete the uh, actual subtools on this. I'm going to go all the way to the lowest. It's going to allow me a little bit of control of moving. And then just go right into the move brush. And just kind of conform this to the shape I want. If you are smart and you build your uh, little flipper in the center of the world, it works a little bit better. Because then you can actually go for the full functionality of the symmetry stuff. And here's an example of that pole, right? So this polysphere has got a pole right here. You see that? And so if you smooth it out normally, if I divide this up and smooth it, you're still going to get that pole. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. There's a tiny pinch right here. But if you hold shift and then release it and does that polish smooth, that pinch is gone. So that's a good example of that pole with the alternate smooth brush to kind of remove it. Oops. So just very simple sculpting stuff on this. I work on a lot of low res kind of stuff like this and just do smooths and moves to get that shape and that form out of it. Now this isn't going to get as much love as I normally give it. So I'll go through and, you know, actually clean this up and then go in with, you know, say the clay buildup brush and start building up those edges to get those different shapes. You know, carve the inside out a little bit. get those forms on your mesh. But I find uh, watching this kind of stuff, when, I <laughs> when I'm doing it in a demo, it seems a little uh, tedious. So uh, I'm going to pass through this pretty quick. Because <clears throat> there's a lot more bells and whistles. Bells and whistles everywhere. <clears throat> so the footbed started something like that. But I wanted to establish at least this part so I can show you this little band trick. All right, so another thing, primitive building, right? So bands, like things like this, the strap on the back of the foot, right? <clears throat> you know, if you think about it, you know, in other programs, it's a spline that you can generate, and then you just, you know, fill it with a loft, basically, and you get a strap. You can do the same kind of processes inside ZBrush with, say, insert meshes. So ZBrush has a whole library of insert mesh shapes, and you can actually take these, and then if you have an object with no subdivisions on it, you can drive these out, and it's going to give you a form. So that's one way you can do it. Like I did generate a curve that goes around the angle here. And then reposition this. And get it so it's that strap, right? That's one way. The way I chose to do it for her was actually bringing in a, another simple tool. So come over here to Polymesh 3D. And I'm just going to select a cylinder object. Frame that quick here. And coming from the game world, I do uh, a lot of stuff with powers of four. Um, and this is just because, you know, quads, you know, if you start multiplying up subdivisions, it's like by four, by four, by four. So I always work in like numbers like four, eight, 16, 32. It's just kind of a habit I've gotten into working in games for so long. So I'm just going to scale this down, the uh, taper here. Any of the primitives inside of ZBrush that have this 3D after it have this nice little tab here called initialize. And this initialize allows you to change different features of these primitives. So you can change you know, different radiuses and scales and stuff like that. So if you're ever looking for like a kind of a different shape or you know, a certain thing inside of uh, a tool, and you're like, well, how would I get that? Try messing with these cylinder, uh, these 3D objects, and go to this initialize tab. And there's a whole slew of features you can play with. So if you ever want to make horns or uh, you know, different kind of like, this is almost like a rubber table leg. Um, things like that. They're very easy to get out of the primitives inside of ZBrush. So I'm going to change my divides here. I don't want that top tapered anymore. So I'm just going to do 16 and that's just 1. Yeah, we'll do 32. Yeah, that's just okay. So I basically just made a cylinder. Nothing special. I removed all the uh, height subdivisions and just literally just had to go 16 around the side. So I'm going to take that and append it back into my scene. So same thing, going to subtool, going to append, and just bringing in that cylinder I just created. If I can find it. Where'd you go, cylinder? Let's try that again. So you have to make this poly mesh before you can append it in. So just hit that poly mesh button, now it's there. I'm going to go back to my object here. Delete this one. And just append in that cylinder. So now I have that simple cylinder shape in here. Very simple. 
And I'm just going to take this, I'm just going to rotate it so it's vertical. So once again, hold shift again. And you want to make sure you have perspective off when you do any rotations like this, because perspective will change how this line draws for your rotation stuff. I'm just going to rotate like that. Hold Alt, move it down somewhere near her legs, and then just scale this down a few times. So this is going to be my establishing band. Now, you may see some people where they'll talk about, you know, not using move to scale. I use move a whole bunch to scale, especially on objects like this. Because right now, you only have vertices at the end, you have vertices at the bottom. There's no vertices in the middle. So if I use move on this and hold shift, it's just going to grow it. Right? So if I want this to be a thin kind of uh, strap that goes around the leg, there it is. If I want it to be like a large tube, say for like, you know, she has a rocket pack or jetpack or something, you just grow it. This is still, it's not distorting the geometry at all. Um, and since you don't have any of those subdivisions on the side there, you can just make like little things like this size and you can grow them to be whatever you want. So if you want like posts or, you know, any sort of things like that, you can just make a little cylinder, put your detail on it and then just grow it out. So you can poly model in ZBrush. Um, don't let anyone tell you can't, because uh, you can. And actually, some of this stuff actually works a lot better. So there you go. So I just started getting that foot pan in there, something like that. And now I'm going to come through and I want to delete the inner and the outer thing. So I don't want those intersections. And I also, the strap, if you look at her leg, actually cuts off right here. So it's not a full cylinder all the way around. So it's actually cutting off at this different point there. So I'm going to solo that. And I'm just going to do my control shift and just get the circle here and then hold Alt to get a red circle. And this is just going to hide that geo, right? So I'm just hiding that area there. And then I'm just going to hide this vertex point. And now I have this kind of strap, single-sided piece of geo that forms a strap. Now, if you have trouble viewing this inside of ZBrush, come down here to the display properties. And in here is an option for double. And this will give you back faces. Basically, it's back face calling. So you turn it on. So if you ever work in this way and you lose stuff in your screen, just turn back face on. Or double-sided. So now we got that there. Now I'm going to come through and I'm just going to delete the actual hidden geo so those parts I hidden because I hid, I don't need them anymore. So modified topology, delete hidden. And now I'm just going to use the move brush at a pretty large setting and I'm just going to move this in. So just move this in here and I'm going to turn off my poly frames. So just kind of conform that strap. Now, if you use a large move brush, a large enough move brush, you're not going to get this wonkiness. Um, so you can actually come through and conform it, and it should hold the ratio of that strap. So you're not going to have a skinny strap, large strap, skinny strap, large strap. So that's a big thing. And you see on a lot of people, if they don't have like consistent straps, it's definitely like one of those no-goes. Because you can make your straps, you know, square. I'm going to rotate a little bit. So I'm just going to go back to transpose and rotate. And just rotate it up. Then I'm going to move it in a little bit so it's actually hugging her ankle some. And then go back to move and just pull this stuff out, kind of massaging it a little bit. Something like that. Nothing crazy. So now I got this single sided geometry. So now what do I do with it? Well, let's go back to panel loops, right? So back to panel loops, have it selected. Hit panel loops and turn the polish off and I'll turn the bevel off. So there you go. Now I've got a strap. It's not thick enough. I needed a thick to print, so I actually wanted to embed into the foot, you know, embed into that heel so it actually created a solid watertight surface when I wanted to print it. So I just made sure that all the strapping, uh, it's one thing to do with any 3D printing, is, uh, you know, you're not really going to see in there. But you need a watertight, so you want to get rid of those gaps. So any straps and stuff you do, just shoot them all into the body. So for this, it's really easy with this panel loop. So you can model just in this polygonal mode like this, and then just change your thickness. Change your elevation so it goes inward instead of outward. And then just hit panel loop, and it's going to start embedding in. So you can change that thickness to how much you need it by, and it's going to give you that nice kind of shape in there. And then after that's done, you just you know divide it up. And turn SMT off to divide a few times hard. All right, so goggles, right? She has these, well, I have them here. They're here somewhere. They're in the box. She has some goggles. Let's go back to the image. She's got these goggles. So how are you going to make these goggles, right? They're a separate piece. I need them to go. Shadow box. Shadow box is all you got to do again for goggles. So I'm going to just go to her face. I'm going to pen in another one of those great polymesh 3D triangles. The star. 
poly mesh star. Go down, select that. Move it down, close to her face. Somewhere like that. And now I'm going to go back to the geometry tab, shadow box, 256, polish one, shadow box. I'll hide the rest of that stuff quick. Clear that mask. And then I already have a really nice little goggle alpha created, so I'm just going to load that in. Make sure my mask can brush on with the stroke and that alpha, and just quickly paint this out. Something like that. If I still have this head visible, I can see how big it actually is pertaining to her face. So I can start dragging this out and kind of get it so it actually fits her face correctly, right? So it's going to save me some time on the back end and actually sculpting this. So I can get it right, you know, at that same size, right? And now I can go back to the shadow box, turn it off. So now it's in my scene. So I turn her back on. Find the rest of her head here quick. There we go. And her fish. <coughs> so I've got the goggles already established, and that takes no time at all. No time. Snagging position them with transpose to get them where I want them. Right now they're a little bit of a mess. So you see, I could increase my shadow box resolution. I could increase my polish, and it would smooth that out a little bit. It's okay for what I wanted to do. I'm going to use that move trick again and kind of get a little bit thin. And now I'm going to Z remesh this. So I'm going to the geometry tab, and I'm just going to run Z-Remesher. This is going to clean that up. So now I've got some cleaner geometry, cleaner topology 2 here. So this is still a little bit too high. I want it a little bit lower, so I can mess with it in polygonal form. So I'm just going to come over, turn off adaptive, turn half on, and just Z-Remesh again. So getting lower, and you can see it's actually smoothing out those edges. It's taking out all those little noisy anomalies, and it's smoothing it out and giving me a really nice shape. And Z-Remesh that again. Yeah, we'll do it one more time. So now you can see, that looks like geometry I created in any other 3D package. And it was a lot funner to make, <laughs> and it didn't take that long. And it was more intuitive, and I find it to be a lot more, you know, as you would do it in kind of a traditional sense. So there's my goggles. And if you've noticed, look how nice this topology flow is on Zero Mesher. And you saw what I started with. It was just that alpha mask. So now I'm down to almost geometry that could be used in a low-res fashion. You could delete some edge loops in here. And then you have like a low-res game asset, so pretty cool way to do things now. So with this, now I can actually start masking this out. So I can mask out this front section here. I'm just going to give it a new poly group. Actually, I'm going to do a uh, uh, rectangle drag here and isolate that front part and come back to that. And now I just have two poly groups for this. So what this allows me to do is I can run different kind of masking features on this. So I know her goggles. I want to be a little thick, so I'm going to divide this up some. And her goggles actually have like a little lid. They have a little lip that goes around the front, because that's where the actual glass or the plastic piece actually fits in, and it adheres to that little lip, right? So I want that to be a little bit inflated, a little bit larger than the other section. So I just set up a poly group quick, and now I can mask by this. I still have a uh, mask brush selected. And I just come to the deformation tab, and you just inflate this now, right? So you can start getting that kind of effect of that edge. And so you can just you know, slide this in or type it in. And you can see it's giving me that kind of nice hard surface edge, nice effect on that goggle, right? Very cool stuff. And once again, no time. Took no time. So I can step back down, so I still have these wonderful subdivisions from Zero Mesher. And I'm just going to isolate this back part again. A little bit more than that. So there. Control W to get that group. Now I need this goggle to kind of conform to her face. So I want to kind of like come back a little bit on her face, right? So I'm going to do that same thing. Just grab this part here. I'm going to divide up. Give me a little more geo to work with. Mask that section. Pull it back out. Get out of solo. And now I'm just going to use the move brush. And I'm just going to grab this edge here and just move it back. And if I turn symmetry on, I'll get both sides. So there you go. And this is, looks really clean right now. So I've got a little bit of lip from that thing there, but this can just be smoothed out, so if you still have your mask on too, I'll just come in and just hit it with smooth really quick. Clear that mask. You can come in and refine it if you want to. Okay. 
It's a very easy way to get really complex forms pretty quick. Now for the nose on her goggles, she has you know snorkel masks basically. They want you to breathe out of your mouth, they don't want you to breathe out of your nose. I just simply added another sphere, brought that in, and then just sculpted that, and then just attached it to the goggles. So just think of it as like how you actually would build it in life, and uh, it's pretty much how you can do it inside a ZBrush. If you come by tomorrow, I'll show you guys the inner tube stuff, which is another like crazy simple thing to do. Like you think this inner tube looks like crazy complex. It took me forever to make. It didn't. It didn't. It's all show. Smoke and mirrors. It didn't take long. <clears throat> so, so tomorrow, I'll start here, where we left off. I'll go through and knock out this stuff here. If you guys want to come up or have any questions, uh, I got the print up here if you want to look at it. I still got to do a lot of sanding, so tomorrow I should be better to look at this stuff too, because then it'll actually fit together. But Paul, I may get Paul to come around. If you have any questions, come on up. And, uh, that's all I got.